Hello and welcome for the webinar or in tribute of the World Tuberculosis Day, March 2024. And thanks for all the people who are joining now in the webinar and uh, also welcome the panel today, taking the time uh, out of their difficult times and joining here in the busy schedule. And uh, today, as we mark the World Tuberculosis Day, in tribute of uh, World Tuberculosis Day, we are celebrating the achievements so far um, in aligned with the WHO's targets. We are also having moments to reflect. So the moments to reflect are this uh, the celebration of achievements by World Health Organization of saving 75 million lives since uh, uh, the targets have been started in 2000, uh, the, uh, the theme of end tuberculosis, NTB. While we still have challenges of about 10.6 million diagnosed with tuberculosis and 1.3 million died of TB in 2022. And uh, the WHO had taken more actions, uh, creating the roadmap and the second edition um, launched in uh, back in 2018 with a commitment to end tuberculosis by 2030 with tangible actions, multi-sectorial partnership and accountability. Private and public mix to increase on to achieve this target and increasing the access to high quality evidence-based tuberculosis diagnosis and treatment and case findings with national tuberculosis program. So the last uh, UN General Assembly high level meeting that occurred in uh, September 2023 had a commitment to end tuberculosis by 2030 with tangible actions, uh, with, with, a, with a more actionable, um, including more countries, which is in a high incident uh, radar and uh, joining partnership with both private and public banks. So following the UN General uh, Assembly meeting um, with, uh, with the WHO, they have actually modified some of the targets to achieve more actions by 2030, ending the tuberculosis. And uh, so the estimation is between 2023 to 2027, 90% of uh, people with tuberculosis uh, should be diagnosed and treatment services should be provided. And 90% of the people with high risk of developing tuberculosis should be able to access TB prevention treatment. So what is that we are doing here in UK? When you look into the data, the TB incidence in England was 7.8 per 100,000 population below the World Health Organization threshold for low incident country. Uh, but the rate is actually uh, declining um, because, um, which means it translates to the low numbers are no longer actually going to persist. There is a, a rate of increase of tuberculosis cases. So the figures published today, but uh, not today, it is taken from the um, UK um, Health Security Agency and uh, the data published in uh, uh, in the TB annual report shows that tuberculosis cases in England in 2022 were, comp uh, were uh, compared to the 2021 stable that is the figures you can see is 4,380 in 2022 compared to 4,411 in 2021 but Additionally, provisional data indicate that the cases of tuberculosis in England rose by 10.7% in 2023 compared to 2022. And as you can see the figure of comparison here. So there is an increase in tuberculosis, especially after um, the, um, the COVID pandemic as well. And today our target is, our goal of the webinar, um, which means the scope of this webinar is to aim the public awareness of tuberculosis and COPD, to emphasize the integrated patient-tailored holistic care, pinpoint the challenges, and also to help them to access um, the holistic care available in their um, counties or the catchment areas. And the relevance of this webinar is to understand the UK strategy aiming to stay supportive with the WHO and the global partners efforts towards NTB to meet evolving patient care needs. So at the end of this uh, webinar, we hope 
uh, that we will be able to help create public awareness on the prevention, identification and treatment of TB and COPD, and also to emphasize and advocate the integration of psychotherapeutic, nutrition and holistic care pathways in COPD and TB care, and advocating public and private sector meaningful collaborations. So the agenda overview today is to understand the interplay of TB and COPD and to integrate and uh, to also to understand the integrated care model for the holistic wellness to deliver care to both populations of TB and COPD. And um, we also have here uh, a resourceful um, patient lived experience um, and uh, which is going to support us to understand uh, um, emphasis on the early intervention and uh, the support uh, being provided by the NHS care and how the currently uh, the person is feeling about uh, the care and the life. And that's the insightful result we are going to get. And also, finally, we are going to end with the closing remarks. And this webinar is uh, hosted by Teletherapies Limited, a platform which provides lung behavioral health, mental health, and uh, occupational health and well being. So it is uh, very important as a founder and director of Teletherapies for myself, the lung health and mental health. And uh, that's the initiative of this Teletherapies. So we have a resourceful panel of speakers, and I would like to express my warm welcome to all the speakers here. Um, Mr. Sorry, uh, Dr. Anantarama Anantakrishna Raghuram, and he's a Chief Medical Officer at the NHS Gloucestershire Integrated Care Board. And uh, myself as a host and a speaker, and founder and director of Chelly Therapies Limited. And uh, Mr. Manny Massey, uh, who's a BBC radio presenter and a mathematician lecturer and a uh, deputy element of the Gloucestershire and uh, Miss Julie Barbis, a nutritional therapist, and she's owner of Nutrition for Performance. And so, once again, very welcome to the speakers. And now I'll be giving the floor to uh, Dr. Anantarama Anantakrishna Raghuraman. Sorry for pronouncing your name uh, wrong. So, Dr. Anantakrishna Raghuraman to give the floor to him to commence this session. Go back to the first slide, please. Sure. Uh, morning, all. While the slides are coming up, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, the ask of me was to talk about the interface between COPD and tuberculosis. And of course, COPD is fairly common, both in the difference in higher income as well as middle and lower income groups. And tuberculosis is predominantly in the middle and lower income groups, but increasingly seen in the rest of the world. So what I'm going to do for the next 20 minutes is to try and put a link between the two of them and see what the challenges we have, A, in diagnosis and in management, but also a little bit of explanation as to why the pathophysiology of disease is altered when you have these two diseases together. So that's where I'm going to go. I appreciate that this audience will be a mixture of patients with uh, lived experience and expertise in that, as well as uh, healthcare professionals. So apologies if I go uh, either too much or too little. If you have any questions, concerns or queries, then let's cover that during the discussion. That's all right. I'm just going to start with what is COPD. Now, COPD is a chronic condition. Chronos is time, that means it, it's there for a long time. The main symptoms, as most of you will know, will be breathlessness, cough with expectoration. But the issue here is the abnormality within the airways, either the small airways or the slightly larger airways, so it's bronchitis and bronchiolitis. But it might also be a destruction of the alveoli, which is what emphysema. And the thing that differentiates this from other forms of obstructive airway disease is that this is persistent. It's often progressive, but the key here is narrowing of the airways. And I'll come back to how TB affects this in a minute, but that's the official definition of COPD. So how do we find out what it is? You have to prove obstruction 
and that is bias spirometry. So if you can't get 70% of your lung capacity out in the first second, that means your airways are narrowed. Fairly straightforward. That is the official definition. If it's between 60 and 70%, the recommendation is to repeat it after an interval to see if it's still there. So, what are the risk factors here? Smoking, obviously. And this is the single most important cause for COPD. And I'm delighted to say that the British government has uh, made it a statement that we want a smoke-free generation. But this is not the only one. Uh, of course, you now have tobacco. You have uh, the, the the increase in vaping, as well as other uh, substances that are being inhaled. But particularly in the lower uh, income countries, household air, air pollution is a major problem, uh, especially where they use biomass as fuel for um, cooking. And of course, environmental factors, and we're all acutely aware of the challenges of air pollution uh, throughout the world. And there are some genetic uh, deficiencies which can manifest. But even within these, you have to have, it's like a Venn diagram, you have to have smoking plus the alpha-1 antitrypsin before you can uh, get a disease. Next slide, please. So, is, are these two diseases separate or is it the same? We know that COPD is a smoking-related inflammation. But what is so different about TB-associated COPD? What is it that makes it so distinct and cause physiological changes? And we know that is because there is also radiological changes that are seen as a result of tuberculosis. And some of the work that we've done from lung biopsies has shown that this is a unique an entity. And there's a paper by Allwood in 2019 which shows that this is a distinct entity. Uh, and we'll come through the differences in a minute. So, GOLD, which is the Global Initiative for Con Chronic Obstructive Airway Diseases, made a new taxonomy to go into the various etiotypes of COPD. Can I have the next slide, please? And this is how COPD is now classified. It's completely different from how it was when I was a medical student several years ago. So the genetically determined COPD, alpha-1 antitrypsin, is the most common. There are others. Um, and then you have the COPD as a result of uh, lung development, particularly with early life events, prematurity, and so on. And you do have some lasting damage to the airways in the developing lung. But the biggie is environment. Cigarette smoking COPD, this includes, as I said before, uh, exposure to tobacco smoke, both active and passive, as well as the increasing use of e-cigarettes and vaping. And we'll come to that in a minute and the difference between using tobacco. I'll always say that smoking is the one that needs to go. And if you're using vaping as a way to get off cigarettes, that's fine. That's the only reason we have to use vaping. However, there has been a significant increase in vaping uh, and that's more that's increasing much higher than the ex-smokers. So there is a problem here that we need to deal with. And of course, it's not just tobacco. It can always get, uh, also get cannabis, and cannabis can destroy the lungs equally, or in, actually worse. And we talked about the biomass and this uh, pollution exposure. So this next entity is the COPD as a result of inflammation and infection. Now, this could be recurrent childhood infections, but the concept of, for the purpose of this talk, this is tobacco-related, uh, tuberculosis-related COPD, and that will be the bulk of what I'm going to talk today. And of course, there's always the overlap with asthma, and finally, there is an unknown cause of COPD. So this is the broad church that COPD has got, and we're going to focus down on the infection-related, i.e. TB-related COPD. Next slide, please. So what is the difference and what's the similarity? So we know that this is predominantly a disease of older people, but there is a difference. In t patients who've got TB and COPD, you do usually get a history of, um, previous history of pulmonary TB, it's, it's, 
and they have residual TB even in slightly younger patients. Whereas in standard smoking related COPD, it's usually a long smoking re related history and the pack years are quite high. So the symptoms, most patients with COPD due to smoking have breathlessness, they do have others, but hemoptysis is particularly a concern when you have uh, when you have TB-related COPD, and and the reason, of course, is because uh, of the nature of the inflammation that tuberculosis causes, and post-tubercular scarring can cause some alteration of the airways and and result in some bronchiectasis, and patients may present with small amounts and larger amounts of hemoptysis. But the difference, and the big difference, is in radiology because you will find the evidence of old TB, in which case it's called scarring, so you've got small lungs, you've got calcification, and you can get bronchiectasis. And when your airways are narrowed, the air is able to go in but not quite come out, and therefore there's evidence of air trapping. You can get similarly with emphysema, but in tuberculosis-related COPD, you often have narrowing of the bigger tubes, bronchial stenosis, and this again causes uh, significant problems. And of course, uh, COPD very rarely affects the pleura, but TB certainly does. Happy so far? So when you look at the lung function, most patients with smoking-related COPD will have an obstructed picture. So your FEV1 to FEC ratio is low. Your lung efficiency, the how good the lungs are getting the oxygen from the air and giving it to the blood is diffused, is reduced as the, the diffusion capacity. Whereas in TB-related COPD, you do get some restriction as well because of the scarring, as I said, with TB. And so you've got a mixed picture of airway obstruction and smaller lungs. And this gives a disproportionate drop in the lung capacity. And when you do a pathology, you will find that there is fibrosis and bronchiectasis and changes not just on the airway side, but also in the vascular side and smaller vessels. And that's what you see on pathology. Now, hold this thought, but often in patients with COPD, you do give bronchodilators, both inhaled, sorry, corticosteroids, both inhaled and oral. And again, that can make the infection worse. Next slide, please. So what are the risk factors in the increase of, of pulmonary TB? Tobacco, we've talked about. Uh, there's good evidence that the low body mass index that you get in pulmonary TB uh, makes you more likely to get pulmonary TB. But the mechanism is largely because there are a number of bacteria that can, can be colonized within the airway. They're there, they doesn't cause infection, but they can induce exacerbations when things go wrong. And this is a good paper that was presented nearly uh, 16 years ago um, in the New England Journal of Medicine. Now, you translate that into TB, the factors that allow these bacteria to survive are also more likely to allow the mycobacterium tuberculosis to stay in. So it's a vicious cycle here. So that's why you've got to be very acutely attuned to patients who are not getting better with standard antibiotic therapy to make sure this putum has been sent for uh, mycobacterial cultures and AFB staining. And if you can't get it through standard sputum cultures, you may need to do a bronchoscopy. And again, be careful about oral steroids for exacerbations that can risk increase the risk of TB. Next slide, please. So we know that the pathophysiology of COPD is largely due to inflammatory. You've got genetic modifications and the environmental factors that results in remodeling of the airways. And the key here is this is irreversible, unlike asthma. And if you get emphysematous changes, that's usually due to the alveolar damage, and that causes uh, is a result of recurrent inflammation, and therefore it, there's intracellular infection, which may um, uh, which make make things worse. Next slide, please. Can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So let's turn it the other way around. So does pulmonary tuberculosis cause? Uh, is it a risk factor for COPD? So there's a good paper that was nearly three years ago now, which looked at nearly 23 articles uh, on this and pulled this part 
and had a look to see, comparing with controls, what is the likelihood uh, and what's the odds ratio here? So they looked at it and they found there's nearly 2.59% uh, odds ratio in getting disease. So there's an increasing risk of COPD if you've got pom prior pulmonary TB. And what was fascinating here was that when they did the subgroup analysis, it was independent of smoking. It was independent of the income levels of the of the uh, of the patients and and the, and the countries, and it's independent of the definitions of COPD or any other factors. Next slide, please. I'm sorry, the slide's a bit too small, but when we looked at the various uh, parameters, particularly in terms of smoking cessation, the odd. A never smoker, the odd ratio was still 2.41, uh, whether it's a higher or a lower income countries, they were all uh, significantly higher. And the confidence intervals are by definition quite wide, but there is something in here that we need to look at. Next slide, please. So that is predominantly work that was done in middle and low income countries. So what, we, what I did is to pull a paper uh, in uh, Sweden, and the advantage of Sweden is they have meticulous records of almost everybody in Sweden. So their Swedish hospitals have got an inpatient register, they have a tuberculosis register, and everybody's data is available. So they picked everybody who's over 40 who was diagnosed with a diagnosis of COPD and cross-linked that with their TB register. Remember, TB is quite low in Sweden. So getting this data was, was interesting. Next slide, please. And what they found is they looked at it by year of birth, they looked at it by sex and country of residence, and adjusted it for immigrants versus non-immigrants. Uh, in other words, were you born in Sweden or were you born out both? And what they found was that COPD patients had a threefold increase in the hazard ratio of getting to active TB with a decent confidence interval here. And those who had had active TB had an increased risk of death, although the risk was very low. So there's, again, the correlation between these two very common diseases is something that is worth looking at. And the reason I say that, it's so eminently treatable. If you are diagnosed with early and you get the right treatment, this is easily remediable and therefore we need to look out for these. Next slide, please. So this is the data that they get. As I said, there's very tiny numbers, uh, about 9,586, and they got, and it's remarkable that they got 100% of, uh, of the data, but that's Sweden for you. And look at the number of cultures they got. 82% were culture positive. Uh, and of that, of course, you get environmental tuberculosis as well. So about two thirds of those were pulmonary TB. The sex difference was, was almost the same. Uh, the Im immigrant and non-immigrant was about uh, four, four to six, so two to three. And again, the distributions across the age group. Next slide, please. So what does this mean for us? COPD and TB are quite common, particularly in lower and middle income countries. Now, we know that traditionally smoking is the one that everybody thinks about when you're talking about a risk factor for COPD. And what I'm trying to tell you is that we know, and there's a good paper from, from China that came out last year, which said that tuberculosis is an important and independent risk factor for airflow obstruction. And in these patients, again, smoking is an important risk factor, not only for the activity of the TB, but also for disease progression. So smoking cessation is vitally important and all the more so in the presence of TB. And we know that patients who have either current smokers or ex-smokers, they were the, the death rates from but medical causes of these were twice that of people who've never smoked. 
And if you have pulmonary TB and you're smoking, particularly if you're a male, you have a much greater radiological changes. So it's more destruction of the, of the lung parenchyma and lung airways. And they found that ex-smoker and current smokers were, ex were more associated with extensive disease. So more damage to the airways, more uh, cavitation in the lung, and it becomes harder to, to treat because if there's uh, persistence of bacteria after uh, aggressive treatment it takes longer. So in the study that they did in Hong Kong showed that you, you're almost one and a half to two times more likely to be smear positive after the first two months of treatment. Remember in TB, we give two months of intensive treatment and then you drop it down to maintenance treatment. And most patients should be smear negative by that point. But if you're a current smoker or even an ex-smoker, it's more likely that you're going to be smear positive at that time, which means that on completion, you're less likely to have complete cure. In other words, eradication of the bug. So that's the important bit, and that's why we need to look at this. Next slide, please. So this is how tuberculosis affects the lung. So you get MTB infection. Of course, it always comes to the lung predominantly. You get active disease, and then the disease burns off, and you get post-lung disease. During that time, especially if you've got cigarette smoking with it, you've got an increased inflammatory process, and you have uh, biomarkers such as uh, uh, MMP, and this causes increased destruction of the cells. And you get the inflammatory cells, the macrophages, the neutrophils, and the lymphocytes, particularly the natural killer cells, and that's what causes the damage to the, the lungs. Next slide, please. So these are the biomarkers, uh, and we can look at matrix metalloproteins. There are a number of them, and I'm not going to go into an elaborate detail about this, but I'm happy to take them in questions. So when we look at bronchoalveolar fluid, when you, when you put in a bronchoscope and get some fluid out, you do get that there's a significant number of, of particularly MMP, uh, MMP9 and 12 in smokers. And of course, the inflammatory marker of IL-6 was associated with treatment failure and relapse and increased mortality. And there's a good work that was done a couple of years ago uh, in the ARJ. So just to summarize, these are very common diseases, tuberculosis and COPD. The common factors there is ma certainly made worse by tobacco and smoking. And what is treatable here is a, an aggressive attempt at smoking cessation to try and avoid all forms of tobacco and more importantly to early diagnose uh, pulmonary TB in patients who have exacerbations of COPD and aggressively treat them would make a difference to the outcome of the patients. I'm going to stop there and I'm happy to take any questions. So thank you, Dr. Raghuram. Um, we are putting the questions at the end of the session once all the speakers have delivered. And uh, so if you could take the backstage now and uh, the next speaker will be on, uh, on the stage. Thank you for your presentation. And it's really insightful to get to you know the basics of an understanding of the COPD and TB interlink and uh, how they play around. And uh, thanks for providing the evidence-based data as well for in relevance to that. I'm going to remove you from the stage. Um, so, um, so viewers, now we are moving on to the next part of the presentation, which is myself, who would be talking about the integration of psychotherapeutic interventions in the care of COPD and tuberculosis. Let me bring up my slide. So what I aim for today's uh, goal is to understand the significance of respiratory physiotherapy and respiratory health overall in relevance to the physical and psychological aspects and to recognize the stigma and mental health challenges of COPD and tuberculosis. 
and to acquire knowledge of respiratory physiotherapy techniques and psychotherapeutic interventions in the care of COPD and tuberculosis, and to explore the strategies to combat stigma surrounding COPD and tuberculosis to promote public health, wellness, and holistic care. So my presentation outline, uh, I wouldn't actually expect people to jump around and go, oh my God, it's nine slides coming up there. But uh, I would promise that it would be a uh, very insightful and uh, very short information so that you can consume today what is our goal as i earlier mentioned to understand the importance of the respiratory and psychotherapeutic and holistic care interventions in the care of copd and tuberculosis so uh, the topic to tackle today myself is to um, explore on the importance of the respiratory health and implications of copd and tuberculosis the psychological impact of respiratory conditions and stigma and mental health challenges in COPD and tuberculosis and to give you an overview understanding of what is respiratory physiotherapy and to understand the psychotherapeutic intervention and how we can integrate psychotherapy with respiratory care and the strategies to combat stigma and holistic care approach. So as you can see on the slide, why is respiratory health important? Our lifeline, uh, most of us, when we talk about lifeline, we, uh, heart comes to our mind, okay? A symbol of heart. But uh, according to myself, I would actually um, try to persuade you to think our lifeline is our lung. So our lung is a main resource organ there to provide the main fuel, the oxygen, Imagine a car cannot run without the fuel. So our body cannot run without oxygen. Yeah, uh, not more than three minutes. So oxygen is the main source for our body and lung is the main player here, which actually uh, gets the oxygen outside through our nasal passage into our lungs and exchange into our blood vessels and into our tissues. And so it is mainly responsible for energy production, tissue repair and immune function. And also it is very important that uh, we have oxygen for physical activity and uh, whether it can be any forms or shapes of physical activity, as I mentioned here, either jogging, playing or sports like uh, badminton or tennis, whatever it is. So uh, physical activity, oxygen is very, very important, which supports the active lifestyle and mental health. So when uh, I know in my previous webinar as well, I've mentioned about the concept of health, the description and definition by the World Health Organization. So health is a combined, it's not a mere absence of illness, it's a combination of the physical, mental, emotional and spiritual integration parts in, in a person that gives the health of the person, determines or defines the health of a person. So mental health is very much important for a brain to function Oxygen is a main source that actually gives that fuel for our cortex function and our other emotional center function. So deprivation of oxygen then leads to cognitive impairment, fatigue and mood disturbances. So what are the implications of COPD and tuberculosis? Earlier, Dr. Raghuram was uh, giving us insights on uh, the, um, the basic definition and the evidence base and uh, what is happening, the pathophysiology and um, what are the risk factors. So I'm going to cover here in the implications of COPD and TB. COPD have uh, manifestations when a person actually is, is when a t label COPD is expressed to a public. Um, some public aware of the what it means and some public is not aware of what is mean. And the main focus here is to make you aware of that today. COPD stands for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And uh, the implications one has is a narrowing of the airways due to inflammation, due to triggering factors. It can be smoke. It can be other genetic factors. So it comprises the umbrella term between chronic bronchitis, emphysema and asthma. and um, as an implication, because there is a narrowing of the airways, there is also manifestations of bronchiectasis, where the airways are widened and scarred, leading to impaired airflow. And uh, chronic bronchitis, as I mentioned earlier, as a result of narrowing, there is a persistent cough and mucus production and emphysema, destruction of the lung tissues, which is the end part of your um, airways, which actually 
in, uh, important in, and plays a major role in the exchange of oxygen into your blood vessels. That particular part, the ass sac is dilated, loses the elasticity um, due to several other reasons. And there is an airway stenosis, the narrowing of the passage due to the inflammation and that leads to scarring. Now, looking into the tuberculosis implications, People, uh, because of the damage, uh, uh, because of the infection, there is a damage in the airways, pulmonary tuberculosis. There is hemoptysis, there's a coughing up of blood due to the damage. Pleural effusion, that, which means accumulation of fluid around the pleural sac, which is a covering of your lung. And aspergilloma, the fungal ball in the pre-existing lung cavity. And post-tuberculosis bronchiostasis, which is a widening of your airways, uh, the bronchial damage following the TB infection, and post-tuberclaw COPD, which is again related to the chronic uh, airway obstruction and narrowing, and spontaneous pneumothorax, which is pneumo means, uh, pneumo means lung, uh, uh, pneumothorax is air in the uh, thoracic cavity, so sudden collapse due to the air leakage into the pleural space. So what are the psychological impacts of uh, um, this particular condition manifesting in an individual um, in COPD and tuberculosis? So as a result of the narrowing of the airways, um, there is actually a restrictions of uh, oxygen being taken in and the uh, expulsion of carbon dioxide. There is air trapping inside the lung, which leads to breathlessness. And the patient actually, as a result, there is also other implications where because they are breathless, that is related to people getting less active and isolating from their um, social interactions. So the breathlessness itself causes them the anxiety and panic attack. So anxiety related breathlessness is a major, major um, uh, implication, psychological implications out of COPD and tuberculosis. Um, so pe people develop this negative pattern and that's um, there are a lot of stigmas when I say the negative pattern, self-inflicted stigma, and also the stigmas uh, through the community and healthcare professional, which I'll be going through in the following slides. So as a result, the people actually get panic attacks. Now, the other uh, implications are the depression and feeling of helplessness uh, due to frustration. And uh, because they are isolating themselves from the societal interactions of the community, and uh, that leads them to feel uh, reduced quality of life. And um, as I mentioned, isolation and disrupted relationships and loneliness are some of the psychological implications with uh, people with COPD and tuberculosis. So ultimately, it is going to impact them, both their physical and psychological uh, aspects of their um, individual and their quality of life. So physical symptoms like breathlessness and fatigue and reduced activity levels and the anxiety, mood disturbances and substance abuse, suicidal thoughts and lowered self-efficacy. Um, the self-efficacy here refers to one's ability to believe in this in themselves that they're able to execute certain functions. So that is very low in those population. And tobacco use disorder is classified as a medical condition in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorder, uh, DSM-5. So now moving on to the stigma and the mental health challenges. So stigma itself uh, displays in six dimensions in people with COPD and tuberculosis. So the six dimensions, as you can see in the slide, the un unconcealable, progressive, disruptive to social interactions, aesthetically displeasing, and self-inflicted origin. So it is all encompasses of both through the community, healthcare professional and patients, as I earlier mentioned. So which refers to here, starting from the uh, stage where the healthcare professionals get trained. Yeah. Still today, the undergraduate clinical training are using these labels of pink puffers and blue blotters to describe the COPD population. Yeah. And that itself gives a, a kind of a, a derogatory and updated term referring and labeling a person of that individual is going to affect their self-esteem and self-efficacy in uh, following the self-management and also there is a negative connotations from the healthcare professionals uh, when they are referring to um, a copd or tuberculosis for, uh, patients and that is actually in their minds oh we are not actually included 
we are actually having no capabilities to execute the function which we executed. People are not liking us. These are the negative connotations or thoughts are inflicted in people's mind, which is ultimately going to affect their quality of life and the self-identity, what they perceive themselves. And, uh, and it's good that say, because of the public awareness and the caution, which is very much needed to prevent uh, the spread of tuberculosis, um, people with tuberculosis uh, have the stigma whether we can be in this particular public places. And there are a lot of misconceptions sharing uh, the properties or uh, the cops, uh, the spread of tuberculosis, which is all a misconception. Yes, it is an airborne uh, infection and there is uh, application of distancing and certain kind of thing. There is uh, the criteria here is whether the person is actively infected or a Latin TB or whether the person has been uh, cured and inactive TB. So there are the lots of uh, distinction and what one should actually, the healthcare professional should uh, convey, communicate this clearly to the patient so that the patient is able to survive and execute the function in a more self-confident and uh, believe in themselves more capable person in the community. Now, um, as I already mentioned about the self-esteem part, um, there is a, um, I've actually supported with all the evidence-based papers under each of them. So there have been research evidences, people with tuberculosis have lower self-esteem and there is impact in their relationships. Um, and this goes also with the people with COPD. And also the well-being concept is disrupted because of all these negative thought patterns and negative messages being uh, conveyed to the people. Now, the effects of the stigma on the mental health as a result of this, as we earlier mentioned about the psychological implications, people have depression, anxiety and post-traumatic stress disorder, which I would like to give a little bit uh, more to it, where post-traumatic stress disorder is not what the trauma, which is happening currently to the people or what is happening right in the present moment, but it is what happened to them in the past that gives them that image and that is disrupting them and the execution of the normal function in the present moment. Now, why addressing st uh, stigma matters? So um, because of stigma, uh, as World Health Organization, the target is to prevent, identify and, and treat. Because of the stigma, people are not willing to access the healthcare. There is a component of lack of trust in the healthcare services to some extent and degree. So uh, people avoid the health cases and as a result, um, they are not keen in, 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 in engaging with the public health awareness or public health targets uh, for themselves or to the community. So fear is a main factor, which is actually there in people, where fear of being labeled or judged um, prevents the seeking care. And delayed diagnosis. As a result of this fear, people actually stay away or withdraw from the uh, interventions. So that is uh, also causing delayed um, diagnosis or delayed treatment, and which further leads into a spiral where there is an increase in the rates of tuberculosis. And uh, when we coming back to the con focusing on the individual, because of um, the stigma, the individual have a social isolation component. And so withdrawals, uh, there's a withdrawal syndrome, I would put it down to, uh, because of all the uh, existing ways of communication, where I would like to stress here how we communicate to people so that they can engage in the treatment and early diagnosis is a crucial part to support the decrease in the rates of spread of tuberculosis or um, um, management of COPD. So now, as I promised earlier, the next part is to understand, giving you an understanding about the respiratory physiotherapy. So why? Because I myself are a respiratory physiotherapist and a psychotherapist for over 22 years. And so today I would like to share the what is respiratory physiotherapy? It is when a label physiotherapy comes into the public, most of them, the thinking process goes to sports massage or is it actually manipulation? It's more to it. Physiotherapy specializes in different sectors like a medical doctor and it, uh, they specialize in musculoskeletal, in respiratory and also in neurological. So I've specialized myself in respiratory. So hence I would like to share 
what is respiratory physiotherapy? So respiratory physiotherapy focuses on optimizing the lung function and manage the respiratory condition. And um, it is actually playing a huge, huge role, very important role in the integrated care and the management of COPD and tuberculosis. And um, uh, recently, um, not um, far away recently there was an harmonized education in respiratory medicine for european specialists which i'm a part active member of european respiratory society as well and the physiotherapy curriculum has been updated and um so what we focus on that is we focus on the lung health uh in people uh, to enhance their lung capacity to optimize the oxygen exchange and to strengthen the respiratory muscle and we focus on enhancing their breathing mechanics by promoting efficient breathing patterns address the breathlessness and dyspnea and improve the chest wall mobility. And ultimately, then we also focus on the quality of, quality of life for people to enable their physical activity to reduce the symptoms, especially coming uh, talking about COPD and tuberculosis, focusing on the management of the symptoms of cough, sputum production is the main focus of respiratory physiotherapy and ultimately boosting the overall well being of the patient. So I would like to give you a taster of what we do. We do more than this, but it is about the taster of major techniques used in physiotherapy is breathing exercise. And I've listed down a prominently, if you have an experience visiting a respiratory physiotherapy uh, or you're care, being a carer for anyone with a respiratory condition, visited a respiratory physiotherapy, you might have seen people being advised with commonly personal breathing diaphragmatic breathing and incentive spirometry. And there are some airway clearance techniques like active cycle of breathing, autogenic drainage and posture, positive expiratory pressure uh, devices. So people might be given some devices to strengthen the inspiratory and expiratory muscles. So the incentive spirometry strengthens in, uh, inspiratory muscles and, and also the uh, positive expiratory, expiratory pressure strengthens the expiratory muscles. And the chest physiotherapy uh, is more focused on the percussion and vibration and postural drainage and, and the other devices, flutter valve devices. So this is actually to give you a taster of what you can expect visiting a respiratory physiotherapy. And uh, understanding the psychotherapeutic intervention, which is a major part, we would like to give evidence-based support um, information. So as I earlier mentioned, people have a lot of stigma, mental health challenges in people with COPD and tuberculosis. So the major evidence-based tool useful here is the cognitive behavioral therapy, commonly known as CBT. So it's mainly focusing on all this negative thought patterns, what the people have, the, the people with COPD and tuberculosis have themselves, the self-inflicted thoughts, um, and also the some of the thoughts inflicted on them through the healthcare professional and community. And that's where uh, the CBT comes in play. Identify the negative thoughts and trying to replace with positive thoughts and to um, go on with the actionable plans, majorly the self-management plans and what can they do to find their identity. And a part of the CBT is the acceptance and commitment therapy which actually gives them a uh, committable actions uh, to execute um, by understanding their value in their life and uh, the other uh, evidence-based tool is mindfulness and relaxation techniques where focusing on the deep breathing progressive muscle relaxation and guided visionary uh, imaginary techniques the other uh, tool which I would like to uh, share here today is supportive counseling and psych psychoeducation. When, uh, when it comes to this, a major part of uh, people with uh, respiratory conditions, um, uh, irrespective of COPD or tuberculosis, if they are signed up for pulmonary rehabilitation, it is a part of the pulmonary rehabilitation. People get supportive education, but the counseling part is something which will be lacking in the traditional model. But now um, the European Respiratory Society is more focused in uh, creating a already created a group and is an uh, actioning uh, creating a behavioral therapist and psychotherapy to support this action plan of creating counseling and psycho psychoeducation in people with respiratory condition and the problem solving therapy uh helps to identify people to identify their practical uh problems and practical solutions for their problem and uh more in incorporated into their self-management skills um and uh like uh, uh goal setting and decision making strategies would be advised by your therapist now how we can integrate psychotherapy with respiratory care that's the very major part we have to focus here today 
So a collaborative approach is required um, in the current model. I've just uh, highlighted um, the tuberculosis strategy England, uh, um, where the weaknesses lie is the, the collaboration is missing at the present. And the BTS guideline for the management of uh, non-tuberculosis, um, that, that statement also uh, focuses more on the nursing care, irrespective of uh, where the WHO strategy and target is multi-sectorial partnering and collaborative work. Um, and uh, so there should be a collaboration between respiratory consultant, GP, registered nurses, registered therapists, psychiatrists, psychotherapists, behavioral analysts, and uh, uh, psychologists to collaborate on the bedside care team. And the community outreach to be collaborated with the social prescriber to help the individual to develop that uh, relationship and partnership with the primary and the secondary. And the coordination uh, of these uh, between the medical care plans and or between the primary and secondary care is very critical in our uh, mission to support the WHO target to prevent, identify and treat tuberculosis and also to support the management of COPD. Now, tailoring the interventions uh, is the next part I would like to share here. Um, personalized care, which is in one word. Um, so each patient is different. So like our five fingers are not the same. So each patient had different needs. And uh, though the pathology and pathophysiology of the disease model remains the same, but the patient's life and their personal identity and their personal uh, values are different. So there should be a personalized care tailored to the person, uh, person's need. And especially the holistic care is should be the main focus because like uh, medicine alone is not going to help the people to survive, su survive the infection uh, where the tuberculosis people are put into the six months or nine months of medication regimen. But alongside the motivation or engagement to even take that medication and to engage themselves in the community and to execute their function in the daily life, a lot of uh, mental health is required and nutrition support alongside with it. So these are the key major areas to be incorporated in the holistic care of uh, management of COPD and tuberculosis. So um, I would like to again stress here in this slide the importance of patient education and empowerment. Uh, again, uh, educating the patient, the psychoeducation, as I mentioned earlier, and the self-management uh, to enhance the psychological well-being to contribute to the overall health. So now moving on to the strategies to combat stigma, the World Health Organization and the NICE recommendation, which I brought together here in uh, four simple um, uh, points, what they actually focus on is uh, education and awareness campaign. And proudly today, I'm actually supporting this by through this webinar uh, to deliver this education awareness of um, uh, pulmonary, uh, uh, pulmonary tuberculosis and COPD. And uh, so what is going to do? What is the ultimate uh, outcome of it? Um, it reduces misconceptions and promotes uh, early, um, early interventions and also promotes some empathy towards the people. And uh, secondly, the counseling and mental health support services. Um, that's what the focus is uh, to prevent and identify and treating the uh, tuberculosis through WHO. And uh, that also uh, applies to the COPD uh, cohorts. So um, to access the availability of uh, counseling services in the primary care sectors, um, that will help the, and, and uh, also to um, connect with the secondary care provider, the counseling services, um, that will help to reduce the stigma related to the conditions, COPD and tuberculosis. So integrating mental health support to primary care is a very key component here. And uh, training the healthcare professionals um, on the stigma reduction. Again, as I earlier mentioned, some of the outdated terms, the derogatory terms, and how they communicate with the patient. Um, people require training, the training topics that I mentioned in the slide there, the language use, the communication plays a major, major role here. Um, it is about the tone and the body language and the way it is communicated to the patient. Teaching a respectful and non-stigmatizing language and at attitudes addressing the biases and stereotypes and patient-centered care focusing on the needs, personalized care of the patient is very, very critical in um, getting the patient engaged with their care management. And the community engagement and peer support groups. Um, community engagement is, plays a 
key role in, uh, in uh, anti-stigma efforts. Um, so peer-led groups provide an understanding and solidarity here, and the collective impact of the community working together um, will reduce the stigma and mental health challenges related to the tuberculosis and COPD. Now, holistic care approach, what is that actually we are talking about? It is all the component which I earlier mentioned, integration of psychotherapy into the respiratory care plan, especially for people with tuberculosis and COPD. Uh, the nutritional care plan for people uh, with the, those conditions is uh, very, very key. So um, call for action for collaboration here is the collaborate across the respiratory specialists and mental health professionals and the policymakers to allocate resources for integrated care models and the communities to support the individuals to promote empathy and reduce stigma. So um, I brought down here, like um, uh, to remind uh, as a reminder, World Health Organization is targets to eliminate tuberculosis by um, 2035. But the the recent UN high level meeting uh, in September 2023 focuses on um, eliminating TB, ending TB by 2030. So the priorities for the TB action plan for England, um, 2021 to 2026, the reference down there in the slide, is to um, first is to recovery from the COVID 19 we all went through and people with uh, tuberculosis and COPD had a higher impact uh, uh, across uh, this uh, spectrum of uh, COVID-19 because most of us have been actually suffered COVID-19 and prevention of tuberculosis, deduction of uh, uh, tuberculosis at early stage and controlling tuberculosis disease and also training the workforces uh, adequately and also using the right workforce to support the care. Um, so the key takeaways, I would like to end my session by um, emphasizing on the importance of the respiratory health, how our lung is very important because we all look at the physical health and we are going to the gym or doing some activities. But the key player here to support our physical activity and active lifestyle is our lung. Yeah. And uh, also to make ourselves more engaged in whatever we do to identify our own values. Oxygen is required for our brain. So it is very important that we focus on that and the stigma and mental health challenges, which I've discussed in my slides and uh, which is leading uh, to uh, anxiety, depression, isolation in people with um, COPD and tuberculosis and the respiratory physiotherapy. I've given you a, a very brief overview of what respiratory physiotherapy offers to the community and the psychotherapeutic intervention. I've uh, touched on the evidence based CBT, acceptance and commitment therapy and uh, mindfulness uh, to promote well-being in the population. And the holistic approach care, where I have uh, um, brought light here um, um, to the holistic care approach, integration of uh, psychotherapy and um, uh, respiratory consultants and the social prescriber to offer an effective care management to COPD and tuberculosis. So it is time to test your knowledge. Um, so testing your sensory power here. Um, I'm, I'm displaying this question here, if you're here on the on the session, if you could type whether true or false for the first question, healthy lungs are only important for physical well-being, not mental well-being. 10 seconds. Yeah, okay, and I'm going to the next one. Which of the following is not a technique used in respiratory physiotherapy? Now moving on to the next question. Which psychological intervention is commonly used to address anxiety and stress in respiratory condition? Now moving on to the next one. How does societal stigma affect individuals with TB and COPD. Great. 
thank you for your time and the participation. And uh, there's one more final question. I just missed it. So the, the final question is collaborative efforts between respiratory therapists, psychotherapists, behavior scientists, and psychologists are essential for personalized care in respiratory management. up and thank you very much um now thank you for your attention and my contact details is on the slide and uh, i would confirm that all the presentation today would be live uh, it's live already and it will be up uploaded in the breathe thrive with devi youtube channel and uh, people who have signed up for the webinar and uh, for who i have access to the email id i'll be sending personally the presentation to their inboxes as well um, so now, without any further ado, I would like to introduce, I can't introduce the next speaker because she's not here live with us, but uh, she has uh, gracefully given a video presentation. So I'm going to upload and share that uh, in a second. Um, I'm a band registered nutritional therapist and nutritionist, and I'm based in the UK. I'm talking to you today about nutrition for COPD. So um, I'll be doing a brief run through of what is COPD, uh, lifestyle interventions, dietary interventions, issues to be aware of, the words of caution, because there are circumstances in which, although dietary interventions may be possible, they may not be desirable. And I'll end up with looking at the individual, uh, the person in front of you, rather than at the disease, and show some examples of when and when might not be appropriate to make a dietary intervention. So first of all, what is COPD? Chronic obstructive pulmonary, pulmonary disease is a chronic inflammatory condition, condition that causes obstructive airflow in the lungs. Symptoms can include breathing difficulty, cough, mucus production, and wheezing. There's a number of different causes of the condition. Long-term exposure to inhaled air pollutants, such as cigarette smoke, industrial fumes, particulate matter, and air pollution is the major cause particularly smoking acute or chronic illness including emphysema bronchitis and tuberculosis um, emphysema was particularly associated in the past with the coal mines and there can also be a genetic element in particular a deficiency in alpha-1 antitrypsin uh, gene a single nucleotide polymorphism that creates a genetic predisposition towards developing COPD. There are various approaches that can be made to mitigate the disease, but once the damage to the lungs is done, then that can't be reversed. However, steps can be taken to try and prevent further damage. So looking first at lifestyle interventions, um, in terms of mitigating future damage, lifestyle interventions are probably the easiest approach to take. And where environmental pollutants are the cause, then removing the source of the pollutants is an obvious step. Although for people who suffer the condition, they may not be either easy or financially achievable. So for example, in the case of smokers, quitting smoking is a fundamental first step. And within that, I would also include vaping and the use of hooker pipes. Although vaping is said to be safer than smoking, there's developing evidence that suggests that it's not as safe as it was first thought. And also from a common sense point of view, inhaling heated substances is going to run the risk of causing at least irritation to the lining of the lungs. The next 
potentially modifiable cause, or potentially not, is air pollutants from the work environment. And although, as I mentioned, traditionally uh, working in the coal producing environments was particularly associated with COPD, many other industries also can contribute. Um, for example, the construction industry, where there may be high levels of dust um, and pollutants, particularly the demolition aspect of construction. Um, heavy industry, um, steelworks, manufacturing possibly, and also some other occupations that may be less obvious. For example, hairdressers uh, are exposed to chemicals, particularly the variety that they spray in the air. Chiropodists and nail uh, technicians may be exposed to both uh, chemical fumes and to nail and dust, um, skin dust. And people who work in the cleaning industry, particularly industrial cleaning, um, may be exposed to pollutants um, such as a cleansing, a cleaning um, chemicals, dry cleaning chemicals, uh, potentially that kind of thing. Although employers have a duty to mitigate any risk to their employees through the provision of protective equipment, that may not be easy in some environments. I mean, certainly in the less expected professions, I've seen nail technicians and chiropodists wearing face masks, which was an obvious step to to protect oneself from inhaling uh, dust and particles, but I see very few hairdressers um, these days wearing masks. Although my hairdresser holds up a shield in front of my face to protect, protect me from hairspray, she doesn't protect herself. The third potential source is domestic um, pollutants. Um, open fireplaces, well, I think those are less common these days, mould exposure, um, cleaning products again, and also things like air fresheners and things that are sprayed around the house. So if a person is suffering from COPD, trying to remove any of those factors where it's feasible is potentially something to consider. Obviously, if there's pollution from living alongside a main road, where there's a lot of vehicle exhaust, moving house may not be an option, but it may be worth the discussion about installing some kind of air filtration to mitigate the risk indoors. In terms of dietary interventions, the approach I would take with a COPD patient where it's appropriate, and I'll come on to that shortly, is to adopt, where possible, an anti-inflammatory diet to reduce the impact of any ongoing chronic inflammation. The first step would be to reduce obvious sugar intake. So that's not just sugar in teas and coffees, although for some people that may be quite a burden. It's also reducing sugary and starchy carbohydrates. So white bread, white pasta, cakes, pies, pastries, um, especially the snacky variety, and also reducing hidden sugar, where you may not expect it so much, um, the fruit juice, squash, fizzy drinks, um, those kind of things. As I mentioned, switching the white, beige, starchy carbs as a red, readily converted to glucose in the body, for the whole grain alternatives, so whole, whole meal bread rather than white bread. And it does involve reading the label to make sure the bread is actually made from whole meal uh, flour, not just uh, white or, or processed flour, which has been colored with a colorant such as caramel, which is common practice. Uh, white, uh, brown rice instead of white rice or even red rice. Um, whole grain pasta, which is available in most supermarkets, grains such as quinoa and buckwheat, and reduce uh, starchy carbohydrates like potatoes. There is evidence to suggest that increasing protein intake may be beneficial for COPD patients, possibly through altering body composition and 
providing the physical means to increase muscle mass. Dietary fats are another area to consider, reducing consumption of saturated fats and ensuring a good intake of um, omega fatty acids, omega threes and sixes. So for example, switching out butter for, um, in cooking for let's say good quality uh, rapeseed oil, um, using olive oil as dressings, avoiding very fatty foods. Um, again, that may be looking at the amount of overall processed foods in the diet. And finally, there is good evidence to suggest that supplementing vitamin D for COPD patients may be beneficial, especially where their levels are low to start with. So for that, I would always test first. Um, it costs about £32, I think, from vitamindtest.org.uk. So issues to be aware of if you are considering recommending dietary and lifestyle changes to a patient is the stage of COPD. Um, dietary changes may be particularly beneficial to people in the earlier to intermediate stages of the disease and may be of less benefit to somebody in the late stages. There is a recognised phenomenon called the obesity paradox, where people in late stage COPD tend to have better health outcomes if they are overweight to obese, which is an unusual paradox. It's not fully explained. There is a suggestion there may be some protective effect from um, from adipose tissue, but this has not been confirmed. It's important to look at the family support of the person uh, or their caring support if they're in a care home environment. Uh, changing a person's diet does involve getting the person who's responsible for cooking and shopping on board. And if that's not the patient themselves, then there needs to be a wider discussion within the family because changing one person's diet impacts on other people, especially in terms of cooking, or in asking somebody else to also eat differently if they don't want to be preparing more than one meal. In a care environment, actually changing a person's diet may be actually quite difficult. Um, and there may need to be conversations around that if it's a route which is taken. And finally, and possibly the most important um, the most important point to be aware of is to monitor the effects of any dietary changes. For example, if a diet dietary changes lead to somebody losing weight, which somebody switching from a very highly processed uh, diet to eating more fresh fruit and vegetables and reducing their sugar in, and fat intake, it may well do, then that may mean that any other medication, any medications that they're taking may need the doses adjusting. So it's important to monitor obvious things such as blood pressure, which can be a first indication that something is changing. And also to be aware or get the, the patient to talk about whether they're experiencing anything different. Um, so that's in terms of how they're feeling and also in terms of any increase or decrease in side effects to any medication they're taking, because that can be a sign that those medications need to be adjusted. So it is very important to notify the person's uh, GP or medical team if dietary interventions are being made. So I've come on now to some words of caution, which are essential to consider. There are circumstances in which dietary changes should not be considered at all. So if the patient is taking oral or injected corticosteroids, such as prednisolone, then they should not make any dietary changes. Also, if they're taking immunosuppressants or chemotherapy, the dietary changes that I've outlined are, do tend to have an immunosupportive effect and that would be very contrary to the action of immunosuppressant drugs. So you, you don't want to do anything that will counteract any medication the client is taking. Another caution to bear in mind is if the client is taking warfarin 
then no dietary changes at all should be made. The reason for that is that warfarin has such a narrow therapeutic interval that changes as small as sitting in the sun for a couple of hours can affect the impact of the drug. So if a patient is taking warfarin, do not even consider making any changes to their diet. So finally, I would like to conclude by suggesting that it's always important to look at the person in front of you, not just the disease. I've created a couple of scenarios here to consider whether making dietary interventions would be pro appropriate at all. So person one is an elderly lady. She has intermediate COPD, lives alone. Cleaner goes in twice a week, her shopping is delivered. She's taking BP medication, blood pressure medication and inhaler steroids. Now I would suggest that for a person who is living alone and unsupported and may not be in a position to observe or monitor any changes that the impact of diet might have, it's not safe to make dietary changes. For example, if changes to diet caused her BP to lower, made her feel dizzy, and that resulted in the fall. She lives alone, maybe she's not discovered for a couple of days. So there's a real risk that the intervention carries a greater risk of harm than actually leaving her to the diet that she's currently eating. Person two, a 40 year old man, lives with family, has an office job, intermediate COPD, but currently taking oral prednisolone. So this particular person, no dietary changes until he's been off the prednisolone for a minimum of three months because we don't want to be countering the medication that he's taking. Person number three, a 55 year old man, early stage COPD, on blood pressure medication and an inhaler, lives with his wife who cooks, he's a bus driver. So this is somebody potentially that dietary changes might be very beneficial for but it's essential to monitor his blood pressure at least twice a week because he's driving a bus. Potentially other lives are at risk if he faints and behind the wheel. But because he's living with his wife, provided she's on board with dietary changes, it's a discussion worth having with him. And finally, we've got a 55 year old man, late stage COPD, he's overweight in a wheelchair using oxygen as required. Dietary changes are less likely to have a beneficial effect for somebody in the later stages of the disease. And even though he's overweight, in his particular circumstances, that may be to his advantage and not to his disadvantage. So there's a very strong argument with making dietary changes, whether it's a long-term chronic condition, is just because you can doesn't mean to say you always should. And it's absolutely essential to look at the individual in front of you and not the disease itself. A final word about tuberculosis, because I was asked to cover this. As a nutritional therapist, I would not work with people who have active infectious diseases, as any interventions I recommend could potentially interfere with their treatments, could clash with, augment, affect the absorption of any medication they're taking. So for that reason, until they've finished any allopathic treatment and have been off their drugs for at least three months, I wouldn't consider working with them. The washout period of the drug is to make sure that any immunosuppressant effect on their system has had time to start rebalancing before trying to take it in the other direction. And certainly where somebody is recovering from a disease which has required six months to a year's treatment with powerful drugs, I would recommend always talking to a professional before attempting to make dietary changes. So in conclusion, that's my very, very brief run through of nutrition for COPD. 
there's my contact details. If you'd like more information, please don't hesitate to drop me an email or give me a ring. And thank you for listening. So um, I hope that uh, you got a great value out of uh, Julie's presentation, um, supporting the nutrition for COPD and tuberculosis. Now I would uh, give the floor to uh, Manny Massey to share his lived experience. And thank you, Manny Massey, for doing this today. And uh, it needs a courage to come forward and share the lived experience where people have lots of stigma around tuberculosis. Um, so I would give the floor without any further ado. So I'll hand you to the stage. Right. My TB journey started back in 1995 and finished in 2022. It has a surprising ending to it. Uh, but 1995, let me take you back to there when eBay was just launched in uh, September. Amazon people begin to use. John Major was the MP. I was going to get married in May. I was going to start BBC radio program in September, October time. I was being a magistrate in August. But in January, I developed a cough. And went to the doctors and the doctor said, well, we'll have to send you to an x-ray for an x-ray. And in February, uh, got a phone call in the middle of my class. I was a lecturer in IT. And uh, so a phone call saying, I've got to immediately go to the hospital, the Gloucestershire Royal Hospital. So I went there and the, there was a chest specialist and he said, I'm afraid you've got TB. And... He said, I want you to go almost immediately to the hospital in Stonehouse, which was a, a special TV hospital. So off I go. And uh, so I was on treatment. I was uh, sent there and uh, I stayed in hospital for three weeks. And uh, they started on the drugs. Um, and uh, then after three weeks, they said I wasn't infectious. So I had to give a list of all the people I'd been in contact with, all my friends and who I've been working with. I was a lecturer, so I used to meet lots of students. Uh, I was uh, uh, a head of a, a deputy head of school in, in the in the college, and uh, and then at the BBC, I had to give the names of the, some of the BBC staff that had been working and getting me ready to start my show in uh, September, and uh, so they obviously contacted those people as well. Uh, but the the main thing was I was going to get. So this was in the treatment started in February March time. And it was due to go on for six months. And I was getting married in May. And uh, I was also due to interview Yusuf Islam. Now, Yusuf Islam, as you, you might know, is Cat Stevens. So he was going to be appearing on stage in Barton Street area. Uh, 500 people were expected. I was hosting it. And uh, so I got a bit worried that I had to let the BBC down and also the local community. Uh, but anyway, the doctor, the specialist, said to me that after three months of uh, three weeks of taking the tablets I wouldn't be infectious so I can carry on as normal I'd lost a lot of weight and uh, so then the wedding was due to be in May and of course if you're Indian you go through all these processes Mendy and everything else and Haldi etc quite a few weeks before the wedding and uh, without me realizing I announced it to the community in the group and my father goes oh my father's a male nurse in the second world war so he was very disappointed he said oh why did you say that in front of everyone. I said, well, no, it's the truth, isn't it? And then no, everyone said, no, 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 it can't be. I said, no, no, it's been diagnosed. I have got TB. And uh, obviously some one person came and shook my hand and said, don't worry, my my um, father-in-law had TB um, and, you know, he survived. So, but everyone, all of a sudden, it was all very quiet in the room. Uh, but anyway, we carried on with the ceremony eventually. I don't know whether people got worried that I was going to be infectious, but I did tell them that I'm not infectious anymore. Uh, anyway, the wedding took place. I, lo I looked very weak and, and so on. Then I was due to go on honeymoon to Kenya. I was already booked. And, they, and I said to the doctor, can I go? And he said, yeah, you can, as long as you take all the precautions, take all the medication, which I did. In Kenya, I fell ill because of my diabetes. I ended up in hospital in Kenya. I'm rushing it now because the time is moving on. Uh, but anyway, basically, I went through the whole process for six months, going in and out of hospital, just uh, going in for checkups and so on. At the end of it, I was told, um, actually, it hasn't gone away. So and I was off work. So I was a lecturer. I had to take six months off. Uh, luckily, they paid full pay at that time. But then the doctor said, I'm going to have to put you on medication for another nine months. 
So they put me on medication again for nine months. And uh, I had to then take time off work. And this time I was only getting paid half the wages. Uh, and uh, obviously struggled a little bit with various things like mortgages and so on. But I lived in a, a nice area in Longford, which is in Gloucester. So it wasn't even in the city centre. And uh, I ha hadn't been to India since 1990. So this is five years later. And, um, you know, nobody else in our family had had TB. Only thing was I was diabetic. I was, I'd been diabetic since 1988. No, nobody could tell me how I might have picked it up, apart from the fact that I used to see a lot of foreign students as my job, whether I picked it up from anybody there, uh, you know, from the college students. Uh, but we, we never discovered that. But anyway, after nine months of treat, second treatment, carried on. Um, the only thing is, um, because I started doing the radio show, I did mention it on the radio because I knew there was a stigma attached to it. Many people had died. I even read an article uh, where in Russia people were dying of TB and in India people were dying of TB as well. So but I wasn't really worried because when I went to the hospital, the doctor said, well, look, we got this medication. It'll work. And it has worked. It, it doesn't necessarily mean death because... Uh, a lot of Indian people had actually died. Then I discovered there was another Indian person, uh, slightly older than me, maybe 10 years, and he lived in Cheltenham, and he was diagnosed with having TB as well in 1995, and he was on medication. Um, and uh, basically, the stigma, it wasn't so much as I thought it might be. People weren't avoiding me. Uh, apart from that, there was one other, one lady who I was going to meet her and her daughter, but then at the last minute, she said, actually, uh, I think I'm going to have to sort of leave that for the moment because uh, you said you've got TB. Uh, and uh, because my daughter's quite young, I'm not going to risk it. I said, OK, that's fine. I said, I'm not infectious. But anyway, she, I didn't see her. Um, but because I mentioned it on the radio as well, nobody said anything. I, you know, I openly admitted it, that I'd got TB, that I, I, I was diabetic. And I'd had pneumonia much a few years later. I've always been talking about it on the radio. Anyway, even now I talk about various issues that I've had. Um, and uh, people have just sort of like accepted it. The surprising thing in 2022 was that I went for my eye screening, as I normally do for my diabetes. And um, so they said there's something at the back of my eye that indicates that I've got some issue with my lungs. And uh, so I said, OK. And. And I said, I had had TB back in the 1995. And they said, oh, well, maybe it's come back. So then they said, they said well, look, we'll have to get uh, to, to somebody who have a look at your uh, chest and so on. So then I got to Dr. Raghuram. And uh, then Dr. Raghuram did all the tests and so on. And the surprising thing was, Dr. Raghuram says to me, well, there's no indication that you've ever had TB. There are no T-spots on there. So at the end of all of that, I said, but I went through the treatment for like uh, 15 months and I'd lost weight and I'd actually, uh, I was coughing and all of that sort of stuff. But anyway, Dr. Raghuraman was saying to me that I had no indication that I ever had TB and there was no scarring on the lungs. Uh, but I was told that third, when I had afterwards, when I had TB back in the 90s, I was told that I've lost 13% uh, of my lung uses. But then I may not have done. and But it's, it's never worried me. I've openly admitted it because I know Asian people always have that sort of worry about. I think it's all to do with arranged marriage in case you didn't get married. But the, And the other good thing was my wife um, didn't mind. Her family accepted it. We still went ahead, got married. Everything she stayed with me, there were no issues. Uh, but I think the NHS uh, were brilliant. They explained everything right from the beginning. Uh, even though they might have misdiagnosed me. Uh, but anyway, that's my story. Thank you, uh, Mani, for that um, insightful sharing of your story. And uh, for me, it actually um, rings a bell like, yeah, how you felt, how was your emotion when and when you announced in your marriage and people, your father actually indicated, oh, oh it, is, it should not be announcing. And how did it made you feel at that moment? The thing is that I grew up, in, I came to this country when I was 10, so I was very uh, positive generally, and I, I grew up as a Christian, so I had a very strong belief in God and all of that, and I used to pray, and I think that probably helped. So it didn't worry me, I just said it, and I explained to everyone. But the thing is, I was a lecturer, 
I was an mm. educator. I'd been teaching since I was 22, 23. So to me, I was 38 at that time. I explained everything to everyone, just like I do on the radio now. As you know, you've been on the radio show as well. Uh, yeah. So I explain things to people mm. right from the beginning. So I explained to them at that time, I'm not infectious. I'm on the very strong medication uh, that there's nothing to worry about for getting, you know, getting infected from me. Yeah, that that's uh, really actually showcases your self confidence and uh, your hope, the positive hope you had. Okay, it is actually not at the end of the world, and uh, I'm going to, going to get cured, and I have a support and your community, your family, and um, like very little people, uh, like uh, when when I actually pointed out the government uh, data there and uh, the strategy management guidelines and everything, the national collaborative strategy from UK focuses on people who are homeless and the migrants and uh, the vulnerable people who don't have support around them. And uh, that increases a higher risk of their TB alongside with their mental health issues. Um, so thanks for sharing the final words and uh, thanks for being present here. And uh, I would, uh, I, um, Dr. Raghuram has actually possibly um, yeah, Dr. Agram is not here. He has left and uh, he, out of his personal circumstances, emergencies, he was here earlier. Mm -hmm. And my heartfelt gratitude for him and to you and to uh, Miss Julie, who is not here present, but she had taken a invested a time to support this World TV to give a presentation on the role of nutrition. And thank you to all audience to be being a part of this uh, support uh, for the World Tuberculosis Day. Uh, 24th of March, 2024 is the World Tuberculosis Day. We did a webinar ahead of it uh, to support uh, the awareness and uh, so that people can start thinking about how, if they have a carer to care for a TB or COPD, how they wanted to care, how to reach out for the resources and support out there in the community from the healthcare professional and also from other resources to tap in. So once again, my big thank you. And I will see you all in the next event of webinar. And uh, signing off here, Devi Sundar. Thank you.